lecture and quiet and peaceful. It'd be nice to have a And Donna, you just don't get it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I have to admit from the audience, so, I'm so great to see like double digit numbers of you here. I, I'm sure it's gonna be like, you know, the last person in the computer dating thing that I finally get to your email and send it out to you that you've already been engaged by the time you get my email. It's sort of like, you guys have already checked out, you're already on your plane home and all, it's like, oh no, one more speaker, really? Well, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to make it so that it's something that in a sense, now that I've gone through the program, looked at all the bits and pieces there, and tried to find something that I hope would bring a, a, a kind of synthesis, a kind of uh, aha to the whole thing at the end. The focus that I really liked of bringing together proficiency and the linchpin that I certainly see in my now uh, about 35 plus years of teaching is the culture product. The part that ACFA couldn't really include in the guidelines, try as they did back in the 80s, now they're trying again, and I'm all over them trying to figure out a way to include culture in it. The, you just don't get it part, I hope you'll get it, as to why I call the kind of presentation that, which is no matter how great your grammar is, no matter how broad your lexicon is, how many words you know, how great you are at all these quick down and dirty online tests on language, if the cultural element is missing, you just don't get it. The, the, the meaning ain't going to be there. Now, I know you've gone through a couple of workshops, some of you have already been to already, that have dealt with the notion of why this element is quite as important as it is. I want to try to put it in the context of a proficiency-based course, a course that really is looking to get students beyond that terrible two-plus threshold from advanced to superior knowledge. And to me, the key is going to be this cultural element. So let's talk a bit about it. First of all, part one is going to be simply the easy part. So why do I teach culture? Ah, why do we teach culture? You can't really test it. You know, it's not good, great. It doesn't fit on these assessment rubrics. So why would we bother teaching culture? If you really are still asking yourself that question, really, <laughs> um, I, I worry for you a bit. As you know, you know why we teach the cultural part. If you leave the cultural part out, the whole grammar and lexical stuff falls apart. It becomes, as Chomsky would call it, and I had to admit, I love this, that no Chomsky, the great one, and all I had the joy of having one seminar in, in grad school. I, I, I won, he, you know, to apply to his grad seminars back in the day. Uh, uh, but he admitted that all the stuff he said about the black box in the head was wrong. That you can't just stuff in grammar, stuff in lexicon, shape vigorously, and you've got language that there is this wonderful, pragmatic, sociolinguistic quotient that's still got to be there. I'll check. So, okay, you decide, let's all say we agree, we're in unison here. Yes, we teach culture, now would be a question, which culture? Because, as we know, even if we fight, my favorite one to use, it's so easy since we're here in the great state of Texas, is to say, let's teach American culture. <laughs> I know, I teach English, we'll do American culture. Real simple. That thing you're drinking with your lunch, what is that? A soda? So pop. Or in Texan, what is it? It's a coke. I don't care if it's a Dr. Pepper, I don't care if it's a Sprite, honey. That's still coke. You only have one thing you drink with your lunch, and that's coke coke. I don't care what it is. This could be a well, it could be a bear. Now, if it's a bear, that's a different thing. I would prefer a bear myself, but coke. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. You can't just say monolithic, monolithically we're going to teach Russian culture, American culture, English culture. What is that? What is it? So, okay, so once we've said, I'm going to have to sort through that, then which culture? The classic one, do I teach Shakespeare or do I teach modern family? What does someone who's learning contemporary American English need to know? Well, I deal with a little both, but I'll let you answer that as I get the presentation. Which culture? Well, the big questions that come up are going to need some definitions. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but you probably know all these already. The culture wars that we remember from the 1970s culminated in some interesting definitions for those of us who are working on teaching languages. Ned Seeley, one of my favorite guys in this side, because he was one of the few who actually wrote books called Teaching Culture. He did mince words. I'm going to call it what it is. He says, learning a language, I think, remember that, 1977, okay, so this was a 
points back. Learning a language in isolation, its cultural roots, prevents one from being socialized into its contextual use. Knowledge of linguistic structure alone does not carry with it any special insight into the political, social, religious, or economic system. He actually broke it down into some of these concrete areas. If you don't know the cultural milieu, you may not know anything. You could read a text about the election between Romney and Obama, but you're not going to understand it until we tell you more about how that works. Even if you know all the words, you know the grammar. So this is a ways back, and not bad, not bad, but well, we refined it a bit. 1981, Wilbur Rivers, one of my heroines from the whole period, in fact, is in the 80s. We moved now into starting to think for the first time about this thing called proficiency. It hadn't really come to grips, we hadn't come to grips as a profession. What do we do with it? And Wilbur, uh, Wilbur Rivers already in the 80s was saying, we must focus on both appropriate content and the activities that enable students to assimilate that content, what it takes to figure out what you want to say. Activities should encourage them to go beyond fact so that they begin to perceive and experience vicariously, enjoy it, the deeper levels of the culture, of the speakers, of the language. That's a cool statement, actually. It's really kind of cool. To get the student to the point, to get our learners to the point that they're enjoying this exploration, Right? Beyond the accusative case, beyond simply learning a bunch of vocab items. Nice, nice work there as well. We're not done. So the 90s come along. Claire Crouch, the next generation, now after Luca Rivers, in her many, many works, I picked one out of many, Context and Culture and Language, teaching 93, at the intersection of multiple native and target cultures. So already she's admitting to this notion that we don't talk about American monolithic culture, we talk about cultures within this rubric of American, or we talk about Englishes, or Spanishes, or Russians, right? So she says, within that multiple native and target cultures, the major task of language learners, I love this again, focus on the learner, their task is to define for themselves what is this third place? Third place, not my background I'm bringing in as a native English, Spanish speaking person trying to learn Russian. And the space that is being a native Russian, but what's that third place between learner and the native speaker? Find that spot. Find that third place that they've engaged in seeking and what does that look like? whether they are conscious of it or not, whether they're aware that they're moving closer toward native-like speech or not. Really heavy stuff for Book. Uh, sorry, for Claire. I like, I like the way that goes, too. Well, all of this now, these three definitions, beg the big question that you all have talked about already at the conference and all right, that we divvy up very crudely, rudely almost, the notion that simply spoken culture falls into these two big categories when we're trying to teach it. We talk about big C culture, the stuff that probably, if you're of my generation, that was the stuff you got. You get Tolstoyevsky, yeah. you get the ballet, you get the opera, you get the big leaders, you get the czars, you get all the stuff that's never going to change in what made Russian culture so damn great. Actually, in my generation learning Russian in the late 70s, we didn't get much of this. Right? My first time there, I didn't know how to get on the metro. Although that was the only way to get around, really. I didn't know how to use a student ticket or my ID card to get a much cheaper rate at a museum. I wish I had you known that. Instead of being charged with an American rate, right? The little C stuff. The ephemera, the stuff that's here today, gone tomorrow. Pop culture. Who's, who do you listen to on your, on your iPod? Right? Who, are the, who are the kids listening to now? The stuff that are cultural mores. How do you shake hands? To this day, given the Russian influence here, I can't, as I greet someone coming in the door, I can't shake hands across the doorway. It's just been so ingrained on me that in Russia, shaking hands across the doorway is like the kiss of death. You've basically told the person you don't like them, and you're cursing them for the rest of their lives, which won't be long because you've just broken one of the big taboos. You'll probably be my travel all the way home. Yeah. So those lovely little C things, how do we fill that in? Now, you know where I'm going with all of this, which is, you got to teach them all, right? They need to know who Tolstoy Dostoevsky are, but they also need to know how to shake someone's hand. They also need to know when to call someone the uh, famously the tu form and the usteres form, right? The tu and vous, 
of thieving. We really all of that word. So you got to know all that. How do we get all that in? Well, now I'm going to switch to my Russian, my Russian hat. Still in the 1980s, two wonderful linguist methodologists, uh, Vasily Vassili Kostomarov and uh, Vitali Vitali Vidishagin, in a book they call Language and Culture in 83, said in the process of learning, this was actually interesting, it was both for teachers and for students, the union of language and information relating to the national culture, however we find it, whatever we think American, Russian, French, Italian, Spanish, Vietnamese, whatever that is, is called lingua culture. Lingua stranavizia in Russian. Lingua culture. The linguistic information and the social pragmatic stuff combined is what we need to teach. So, think about this. That would be lingua cultural teaching. If every time we teach the possessive case, what fits into that culturally? When does one use the possessive case rather than the infamous la plume de montant de sous la table? Whoever that heck says that, right? Whoever says these funny constructions that we have in our book, right? Book, John, the book of John, John's book. Really? Seriously? As opposed to, as opposed to uh, the classic uh, lost and found. Set it up in a cultural situation, you're now lost and found in the Helsinki airport, and everyone's sorting luggage in Finnish. Okay? And now suddenly there's a reason to use the genitive case. Whose is that? It's mine. It's, oh no, that's Merrick's. That's a, but in the language. And now it's lingual cultural instruction. I'm preaching to the converted here, I know, but I'm going to play this a bit. I want to talk now specifically about lingual culture in items or objects you may not have thought about as simple, common ways of doing this. How simple is it to realize that cultural information is embedded in almost every single common, everyday item on the table here in our daily lives? Simple, right? Look at something as straightforward. You don't have to know French to know what you call a stick of bread. It is, of course, the baguette. In baguette. It is a baguette. It is a lovely baguette. Look at the baguette. There it is. It's golden and long and beautiful. Yes. Well, it's not just a breadstick. In French. In France. In French. To call it baguette is getting the right name for this item. But what is it? What is a baguette? When you see them, tell me, say, say, no, for It's, yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the essence of the dinner. It's the center of the table, right? Why do we see people and still have the joy? They have been back to Paris in almost 20 years, finally got back this summer, and damn it, they're still carrying, riding the bicycle with the baguette on the, on the backpack or under the arm. Yeah, I loved it, right? The baguette is still there. It's the center of the table. You can't eat without the bread, right? And it's got to be this notion that I have lunch, but I have no baguette. But you have a whole meal here, you've got to, you, but I don't have baguettes. Oh, can we can't even, like, it's a culture of eating, it's a culture of food, it's, it's French. How do we convey that to our students that it's not simply rainbow bread, it's not wonder bread, it's not a loaf of bread, the white bread that you can squish into a wall, it's not that, this is baguette. And it's a whole culture, so even in the simplest lexical items, the dictionary won't give you that. Look up the word baguette, and first of all, what is it going to say next to it? At best, it's going to say baguette. Oh, sorry, it's going to say bread. At worst, it's going to say baguette. <laughs> is baguette? Is in English baguette? <laughs> Doesn't help me. We need a cultural dictionary that says it's a baguette. It's the center of life. It's the love of the people. I'm going to be honest. Ah, from my, my culture here. La piñata. Okay, look at the dictionary, by the way, and. Piñata. <laughs> Uh, what a piñata is, piñata, it's a piñata. There's no one word definition. So we try to say, okay, it's that big piece of paper mache and wood that we hang up and it's filled with candy and little toys and stuff and you whack it with a big stick at someone's quinceaneros or you, someone's birthday, whatever, and breaks and children go nuts and then you can't call them down because they've eaten too much caffeine and sugar. Okay. But, but it's not just that, right? Piñata is a whole culture of celebration. What's behind the notion of why do you break the object to get to the candy? What kind of folklore is behind all that? The whole religious connotations behind so many of the 
uh, images that are used in the pinata. I mean, the thing is, when they you buy them in the U.S., you'll get them with things like you know Star Wars figures, and they had actually saw. I really did see one that had had uh, the, the Twilight characters. As oh, no. I personally wanted to hit them. I really <laughs> not hit them. So there's again no one word definition. It's a whole cu there's a culture there. I'm getting, I'm getting to this. Of course, I can't turn down my my native Russian or not native, but my native Russian here. But the Russian. The famous little nesting dolls, and that's what they say. You look at Matrosh, and say, nesting doll. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> that tells me so much about this little object. Well, it, again, has no one word definition. Yes, they're dolls that fit inside of each other. But what all goes behind it? Why are they called the little mother? Well, because they're children. And again, well, what's so important about that? Ah, well, now the culture of children in Russia has real meaning that now is going to fit into all of classical Russian literature of the 19th century, the golden age. It's going to carry into Putin's declaration in 2001 that every any Russian mother, white, white Russian mother, who had more than two children would receive, yes, it's true, anyone, an SUV. An SUV at 20,000 rubles. Yes, you guys, you, you had to have your third baby, though, it had to be a white Russian baby. It couldn't be one of those other babies. This is Putin had a way of saying, not very tactfully and all that. Our, our presidential candidates, by the way, are not the only ones who can make these incredibly stupid remarks in the middle of a television interview. Russian ones do very well at this as well. There's a, a whole notion of folk culture there. Most of us think that Matrosh are ancient, old, kind of, it's been centuries and centuries, what now? These were actually relatively new, very late 19th century, early 20th century. They've been, basically been around just a little over 100 years, but my God, we see them now as a symbol of Russia, practically. So I'll do one from the US as well, one from my favorite. <laughs> the driver slices. Driver slices. So if you were learning English as a non native language, and someone says, <coughs> you'll need a driver's license to cash a check. Okay, I'm not a native person of any kind. I have my passport, I have my ID card, my student ID card. But you look up driver's license and it says, you know, a license, an official legal document that shows your right and, and, and capacity to drive a car or a vehicle. Is that really what it is in American culture? What is it for some of you? When you think driver's, when you first got your driver's license, what did that mean? Freedom! Freedom! It is, it's freedom! No more mom picking me up from anywhere. I'm going to drive myself. It means going to Texas it meant a lot more when I got it because getting your driver's license also meant at that age. You could own a gun. You could own a gun. <laughs> oh, in Texas, you could own a gun at birth, honey. <laughs> they, get, they make rattles about guns. I, <laughs> no, that's true. You could, buy, you could buy a gun. It means already at that time back in the day, you could drink. Right? Been drinking at the age of 16 at one time. It's been adjusted since. Oh, I know. It's such a pity. It's such a pity. So, it's this kind of culture of coming of age, the getting of the license, and a culture of law enforcement. The classic license, please. Registration of license. Yeah, you got it. You got it. It's a big spray, right? Register license registration. Let me see it, right? So, you see what I'm getting at here is that. It's not just about the words, it's not just about getting a dictionary, it's not just about knowing the grammar, there is this important stuff of culture. So how, where do we go from here? How to proceed? If you were the instructor, or the learner for that matter, how do we proceed? Culture days, this was my joy. The fun I had as a learner, culture days, right? So, oh, we got ahead in the book, we have an extra half hour, let's do culture. Let's see what I got in my bag, don't you think? Oh, look, right, I happen to have here uh, a poem by Akhmatova. I'm going to read you the poem. Of course, in first year Russian, you don't know jack of what Akhmatova is saying in first year, but you're going to learn a little bit about Akhmatova. It's cool, it's nice, it's useful. You file it away for maybe a day or two, and it's gone. Culture days never worked. It was this idea that, well, if you've got some free time, talk about culture in your class. Culture modules. So we integrate into class a little section where we do culture, we talk about the metro, we talk about drinking, we talk about eating, we talk about all the things you need in big culture, little culture. But again, it's kind of, it is modularized. It's not integrated at all. We're still not there. Cultural knowledge. I mean, that's what it's all about. How do we get our students to go from, I know nothing about Arabic, to I speak, read, write decently in Arabic, and I know a good deal about the Arabic-speaking world in 
that sense of I can go there and not make a terrible gaffe. Right? We want to avoid those situations. I remember my days in the State Department, we really tried to avoid the situation, right, of our first group of Arabists going out into the Middle East across men, crossing their legs, and having their shoe showing out into the audience, right? So don't, certainly don't do this, right? Don't do certain things in Russia. So how do you get now to that? Well, I'm going to preach again to the choir here, and I'll move quickly this, because this is your territory. Before the 1980s, largely in the academy, anyway, fortunately, government started moving away from this sooner than, than we did. But up to the 80s, the notion that language acquisition proceeded in a linear manner was simply taken for granted. I'm embarrassed to say, in a number at least, I'll speak only for the American Academy, a lot of places still believe this. Language requirements are done by semesters or years. We still talk about a second year knowledge. What the hell does that even mean, right? You know, two, we have a two year language requirement. You will graduate with a second year knowledge of Russian. What does that mean? Language acquisition that moves in this notion of first year, second year, third year, fourth year, and then what's here? Fluency. After I've done four years of any language, I will be fluent. Well, you might. You might if you're an incredible language learner, if you had an incredible instructor, you were using really cool methods, you got lots of cultural instruction, you might be. But the truth is we know that's not the way it, it works. Uh, we're happy that by 85, borrowing from the government ILR documents, by 1983, the actual uh, proficiency guidelines come out based on the FSI, the common yardstick, blah, yada, yada, you all know all this, changes the way we look at language from this, right, the long thing, to the infamous, Cone of fun, right? The joy that we all experience of saying, here is how we start. We're going to take your young little minds as we tell our first year students who come in, you're down here at this little point, you know nothing about Russian, okay, you can say, what got maybe? Uh, that might be about it. And I'm gonna take you after two and a half intensive, horrible, mind-numbing years of pain and work and torture and wonder to about here. <laughs> And all this, well, deal with it. You'll, you'll catch on, not to worry. If you're in the government service, mostly we try to shoot for here. Or ideally, we'd like to get it here. Get it not nudging us into disappear. We're moving more now than we're requiring the level three or higher for certain folks, I would like that. But how do we do that? The nasty part of it is, now I'm gonna skip this, these are the descriptors, you all know the descriptors. This is the nasty part. This is an old slide from Judith Liskin, the sparrow of our Ohio colleagues from here at UT back in 1982, when she fleshed out the FSI model of training in hours based on the four categories of languages. So that if, for example, we know that if I were to take Russian, and let's say I'm an average language learner, that to get to that level of speaking proficiency that I want to, a two plus, an advanced plus, I need 1,320 hours of instruction. Okay, how many do I get in my usual, in a typical four-year university? How much, how much, how much? 45 to 60 hours a If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, you're absolutely right. In total, I will not even get half of that. I can barely, barely hit the 16-week, 480 hour level which might get me, as I say, as my average learner at best to a one, would still keep me at the intermediate level. Which, by the way, is where about 70% of the most typical university American across the board tend to graduate after a standard program of language study, is at the intermediate and That's it. That's it. So how do we do this? We've been given this incredible task. You all have it much worse, actually, than we do in the academy because we don't have, for the most part, an accrediting agency telling us you need to get your graduates out there at a two or a two plus or, God forbid, a three. Because once you start to look at the reality of the numbers, you say, goodness gracious, how do I do all this? And how I'm having trouble already doing the grammar, the vocab. How do I now work culture in all this? Well, enter part two. How do we get to this stuff? I want to talk about three types of competencies that I think can be folded into our programs now with a very, with a little, just a little bit of tweaking. 
cultural literacy, the idea that is part of developing linguistic literacy. I know the vocabulary, I know the grammar, blah, blah, blah. I can develop the cultural ability to use that grammar correctly, to use that vocabulary in context. I want cultural competence. If I'm a two plus in speaking, I need to be a two plus in culture, too. And all that leads to what I think all of our bosses are telling us, government bosses and academic bosses, we need global competence. It's no longer as it was for us. You're learning Russian so you can read Tolstoy, or you're learning Russian so you can teach Tolstoy. It's so that you can do something out there, so you can go to post and do something amazing. Be effective in your job, so we need this global confidence. Okay, it's test time. And I, I, just in time, Carl will see this next slide about 140 times, so he's like, oh, not again. But I love this one because I used this text when I was in Russia back in the 80s doing dissertation research and teaching English with my kind of study group there. This is right after Chernobyl. I was one of my five Americans who agreed to go to Russia after Chernobyl. And there's a reason I don't have children now. <laughs> uh, Chernobyl, Chernobyl made it so easy for us to be there for that period of time. Uh, I used this text because it was current, it was hot. I was teaching a course of contemporary American literature, so it was like a hot text. And I realized right away that I suddenly had a thesis for my next book was why was it that the students who had, Russian students who had beautiful grammar, superior, astonishing, deep, broad vocabulary, why couldn't they deal with this very straightforward text I was giving them? So here's the text. This is a, literally the first paragraph of this text that none of you are looking around to see, with the exception, I think, of our generation might still remember this, but after that, I think very few of you are going to remember this, even if you know this text. It's from uh, Jay McInerney's Bright Lights, Big City from the, from the 1980s. So it's 1984. This was the hot number one best selling thing in 1984. It later became an incredibly bad movie with Michael J. Fox. If you hear that, don't go see that because the book is actually quite interesting. So here's how the book starts. This is it. You're not the kind of guy who could be at a place like this at this time of the morning, but here you are. And you can't say that the terrain is entirely unfamiliar, although the details are fuzzy. You're at a nightclub talking to a girl with a shaved head. The club is either Heartbreak or the Lizard Lounge. All might come clear if you could just slip into the bathroom and do a little more Bolivian marching powder. <laughs> then again, it might not. Somewhere back there, you could have caught your cut your losses, but you rode past that moment on the comet trail of white powder, and now you're trying to hang on to the rush. Your brain at this moment is composed of brigades of tiny Bolivian soldiers. They're tired and muddy from their long march through the night. They're holes in their boots and they're hungry. They need to be fed. They need the Bolivian marching power. <laughs> and right away, my students. Question? What is this text? <laughs> what does it mean? I understand nothing here. <laughs> okay, so there it is. Lexically, not that complicated. Grammatically, not that complicated, right? I look at this and see fairly straightforward subject or object with little prepositional phrases tucked in. It's nice. So what's causing the students to go, I don't get it. By the way, I include my mom in this. I gave my mom this text just for fun to see what you do with this mom. My mom was, by the way, uh, she's a, a four or five in no language. She was not fully educated either in Spanish or in English. And so she's kind of in this great interplace of knows a lot of Spanish, knows a lot of English natively, but can't ever score above about a two plus three. Uh, she reads this and smiles, you know, yes, 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 I love stories about Latin America. <laughs> so I, just love, I love this. But I don't understand. Are they in Latin? Are they in Latin? Or are they just the what is that power by the Mom, I'm so glad you don't know. <laughs> in 1984, what the Libyan marching powder is, I suddenly thought a little better. So what is, what is it? So I start. Now, you're my students, we're in Russian, this is how I did it. Both to a, a, a native speaking a group of English speakers, Americans, and my Russian group. Okay. Where are we? Are we in an urban place or a rural place? <laughs> and this joy urban. Is our hero male or female? Male. He's male. Male. Mm -hmm. Is he of the, what's his what's his income? Is he of means or is he really struggling poor? Yeah. He's got some cash. He's got some cash. 
Okay? Uh, what kind of place are we in? Locality. You said we're urban, so where are we? CD. See, I love you, CD. I go, CD, sleazy, scummy, we're all in How do we know this? It's not in the text. How did you, you're right, and I could do more questions and get them right. But how do we know this stuff? Shave Right? Go for it. It's like, it's like those pictures that you have, you, you look at them, just, you know, just dots. Just dots, but if you get close and stare at it, or if you step back, however you want to do it. There's a hidden picture inside. It pops out. That's the culture. So how do we get that? How do we know what heartbreak is, what lizard lounge is? How do, how do you know right away if I say, native, oh, native speakers of American English, if I say to you, let's go to the lizard lounge. <laughs> it sounds like a dive bar. Right away you go, lizard lounge, really? Really? You've got a tie? You're going to the lizard lounge with a tie? You know, right? We know this stuff. This is the stuff, the stuff that cultural literacy is made of. Right? These are the details that technically, you know, your mama didn't teach you and you didn't learn in school. It comes with being immersed in the language. It comes with the, the, this cultural knowledge. Russian has this wonderful term to this. It's called, uh, loosely the translation would be background knowledge, but they use the term what's there? What's there that the picture is painting on? The canvas. And the cultural canvas is the stuff we need to teach. Okay, so now we move identifying the problem, and I did with the students in Russia very quickly, ooh, got it. You've never met an American before me. You've never traveled outside of the Soviet Union. This was 1985, so you've never traveled outside the Soviet Union. Yet you know all this English, but you can't read this text. That is understand it. You can read the words, but you don't get it. So where do we go? Well, I realized the first thing I needed to do was look at the text I brought them to, look, to, to, to deal with. So here are the choices that we've got when we teach. We can, as I was taught Russian, the first category, which in my view is the least effective for cultural proficiency, created text, text that we produce, text authored by non-native speakers for non-native speakers to achieve predetermined curricular goals. That's a good thing in the sense of, I need my students to know 750 vocabulary items and this much grammar, and I can create a text that will do that. But that's kind of it. Semi-authentic text, I go to the next step, and I want a text created by a native speaker and or a non-native speaker, but based on original language materials that I've adapted to fit my curriculum needs. So I take that same bright lights, big city, but now I might add a glossary, I might add pictures, I might do all kinds of things to help the student get it. Or we go to the big bad boy, the authentic text. Text created by native speakers, for native speakers, for consumption in a native environment. This is what it's all about. This is what we want to get us. That, that's the text I just showed you. We want to get the student to the point that she can take that text, Bright Lights of Big City, and get it. So how do we get out there? Media, 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 media. We mix it up. The textbook is not thrown out. We use this. We go back to Carl Bly's talk on the very first day. This is the best part about these open resources. Pick and choose what you think fits the curriculum need, what fits the student's need. Take this wonderful uh, resource of the textbook and say, I now need, in a sense, to customize this to this, this kind of material. Add to that reality, the stuff you've got around your table, a pen, a piece of paper, a cup, whatever, whatever. Music in all of its shapes, forms, sizes, and fits. Film, one of my absolute favorites because it's so culturally embedded. TV, yes, it's not all bad. Even advertisements. 30 second or 60 second capsules of amazing when you're trying to teach cultural information. You think of, think of your favorite, if you've got a favorite commercial, and what does it do in terms of the minimal language and huge amounts of cultural information. Web materials, pick a website practically, most websites, and even podcasts, and ways to store this material. If you've got a chance to hear Orlando Kelms talk on the first day as well, his Conversa Brasileira is, is built all around these podcasts that students can build on this. So let me give you a sense of what I'm talking about here. So here we go, we've got the different types that are coming up. Uh, of Realia, for example, one of my favorites, ephemeral. The stuff that's here today, on tomorrow, an object, an item, a relic of everyday life 
the habits that we do, the rituals we do, can be something as simple as a Coke can. Literally, that can become a language text, where culture and language are mixed in together. How does it work? How would you use this? First of all, how is that can on the left different from the can on the right? And it's not simply the script. So the can on the left you buy down upstairs here in this building, the can on your left you buy in the Moscow subway. What's the difference? What will we talk about in class? Because the student does it's cocaine. Okay, I get it. I know what cocaine is. Ah, uh, but it's not. Also, something huge in ingredients. You read, for example, that Coca-Cola and Mexico uses authentic uh, sugar cane rather than the It's so good. good. <laughs> and it is much better. It, it is. is much, yeah. much better than just American one. Absolutely. So the actual object might be different. Go ahead. Yeah, please. No, I was going to say the calories and the cost are so good on any other packages. You bet. Exactly. Right? So packaging is different. It looks similar, the same, in fact, but it is different. What about the whole vending question? Where can you buy Coke? Where can you buy the cocaine in the States? Anywhere. Anywhere. Anywhere, basically. And literally, around the corner by the restroom if you wanted a Coke to take. Into the restroom, you could have one. In Russia, where would you get a Coke? Where are vending machines now traditionally? Even, even now, even in 2012. You can find it at the airport, exactly. They're going to be in very particular, only semi-public space. They're actually like not out on the sidewalk, for example. The idea of seeing, and it's strange, actually, in the Soviet days, they used to sell this kind of fizzy water on the sidewalk. Vending machines, though, you don't see as much. You're going to see them tucked away. So you can see how even in something as simple as a pair of set of car keys, a Coke can, uh, these things that we think of as just everyday objects can become part and parcel of the languages. Let me put something that is much more traditional, but we'll talk about it anyway here. The metro map, also ephemeral because it changes. Indeed, that one that's up here on my slide is from about two years ago, and already eight more stops have opened in Moscow. It's not getting quite creepy, actually. I'm not going to be able to fit that on the slide soon. But there it is. So what, did, what does this tell us? Metro map. For a Texas student, by the way, I might as well have put up a map of yeah, thank you. <laughs> I mean, sorry, the genome map. I could put, I could have put, um, you know, a map of ancient Rome. It's that unfamiliar. Why? I've never, in most cases, seen a metro, been on a metro, right? I, as a Texas person, never. I still remember the first time getting on it, which was my first experience, the New York metro. What? What? <laughs> that to be my fire with that? That was great. I since then have gotten very, very fond of metros, including the Moscow. One. So there it is. So the whole notion of culture being unfamiliar, what's the same, what's different, in Russia, or if, if this were Moscow, this is Moscow, if it were Tokyo, Mexico City, uh, London, that's not going to be so much a foreign language, you, you see where I'm going with this, what would be the kind of obvious lesson around this in any of those contexts of language or city? How, what role does the metro play in places like London, Tokyo, New York, Moscow, bon uh, uh, Berlin. After driven, and what the metro means to be driven after the bomb. My, my big, perfect example, right? What does it mean, the metro? Is it simply a, a way of getting around? Or is it the way of getting around, right? I mean, it is used by everyone. I mean, I mean, one of the things that fools my students completely, even those who do know the subway, whether it's from New York or even Los Angeles, is that, oh, in Moscow, everybody rides the metro. Everybody. I mean, in who takes the bus in Austin? Right? Well, students. <laughs> and yeah, and you really get into this interesting class thing of what is public transportation all about in almost anywhere in the world except the United States. So it's really kind of cool in terms of cultural literacy that talking about taking the bus somewhere in most European, most cities in the Middle East, most cities in former Soviet states, is completely normative. It has nothing to do with your class. It has nothing to do with your ability to have a car, not have a car. It's simply efficient. It's the best, easiest way to get there. Yeah? I talked about the metro about in Paris. Yeah. The class kind of looks like depending on what line you take. Right. It's still messy. It's still messy. And it, 
in, in Russia, uh, Moscow, the one that drives me nuts is uh, Northern Poland in, in New York and Philadelphia and Boston, the red line, the green line, the yellow line. No, no, in Russia, of course, they call it the two endpoints, right? The line is named by the two endpoints. But of course, the lines have now grown greatly since they were named. So the endpoints are no longer endpoints, they're just stops. <laughs> so they'll say, oh, take the, you know, the Gorkovskaya Filatovaya Linea, and go, that would be, they would kind of look at you, well, that's the line that goes from there to there. Say, but, but I need to get to there. And I say, if that's the green line. Well, yes, but no one calls it that. Yeah. So there, there it is. And so, okay, one, one more thing. Just, I'm in, again, I'm staying in Russia just for the hell of it. And for those who do Russian in here, that's not just a menu, it's a Lenten menu. What's interesting about a menu? If I want to, by the way, go back to the metro map and say, for those of you who are more, say, I don't really want to, I don't feel that comfortable being the carrier of the, the culture. I feel much more comfortable dealing with the language. Well, then do verbs of motion with the metro map. Kill two birds with one, three birds with one stone, right? The combination as well as the actual verbs, as well as the information about the metro. What's, what's, what do you see in front of you here? Even if you don't read a word of Russian. I'm counting on you not being a word of Russian. In fact, you say, what can you glean from that? Put yourself in the position of a zero plus learner. Category with who put it Exactly. And you can see there are main topics. It says at the top, Lenten menu, salad soups, hot dishes, and dessert. So they're categories. And then we have dishes. What else do you see? Numbers. Numbers. What do you think the numbers? What, what, again, guess. Use your price. cultural knowledge. Price. Prices, absolutely. So I'll, I'll tell the student, this side is the prices. Okay? And it's in rubles, so you've got rubles and copex, although you can tell almost nobody even uses copex anymore. So you've got rubles prices, and they go, okay, so, so what are those? Uh, I mean, good, 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 good American, right, building on the cultural knowledge calories. Guess what, in Russia, not so much. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> just, just not an interest. <laughs> but but let's, let's say good, and we'd say great guess. But no, no. <clears throat> weight. It's weight in grams. Okay, so that's a portion size. So the students go, what? They come and bring you your food, they got a little scale, what's going on? Actually, it's not quite off that far off. It's basically saying you will get, you will pay this price, 35 rubles, for this soup, and it's going to be a dish that will have this amount. And the person at the next table will get the same amount for the same price. This goes back to a mentality from the Soviet days of, am I getting what I paid for? So you see the cup thing with this. I mean, you're getting literally all this great cultural stuff from a simple, simple bit of ephemera, right? There's so much stuff that's in it. Now, I can take this further. We don't have time, but we go through the, the items and say, okay, I'm telling you ahead. I'm giving you a word that's probably not in your vocabulary in, say, second year or first year when I would use this, which is this word, posle menu. So, lent in the menu. So, it's, the, it's for lent. Well, what do you think makes up lent? in Russia. And right away, we suddenly have gone into an incredibly interesting discussion, first of all, on what does Lent mean? Right? Go, oh, well, that's the period for you know, Easter. Okay, so what does that mean about religion in Russia? What do you think? You know, sort of generalized. No meat. No meat. No meat. Right. The first discussion is, oh, so they're Christian. So, I love this. Oh, so they're Christian in Russia. <laughs> Seriously, right? You know, I thought they were all atheists. And you say, well, they're not the Soviet Union anymore. No, no, no. We're, we're good. We're good. So, so what, what Christianity, what brand do they use, as it were? Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. Again, this is new for 90% of our students, so great discussion there. But then we move on. So no meat. And as we look, we start saying, well, how can you have main courses, hot dishes, with no meat? And you start looking, and that's when we start to say, well, there's mushrooms. There's all kinds of dried fruits, right? There's ragu, a kind of uh, ratatouille. It is exactly that. And so culture, culture, culture that says this. And I'll do one last one here, and I'll make this one short. This ties in with our map that we had before. This is a, Mo a Moscow metro ticket. I put this in the category of ephemera because they change it every, every year. I go there, something different is there. It's always wonderfully, it was there, one of the nice things about the Soviet period, you could count on it. It was always the same. You had that one five kopeck piece, they dropped it in, you walked into turnstile and got on. For 20 years, I kind of did it that way. Suddenly, they came up with a token, then it was a plastic token, then it was a ticket that you swipe. Now, it's this one that you tap. 
the tapping is a great way to teach an inverb, put it on this inverb to touch to the surface, put it on the air. So, again, a simple metro map. What do we do with it? Looks real simple. Moscow metro. Not a lot of stuff to teach on this, right? Or is there? <laughs> two words? How do you make a lesson out of two words? Oh, you create that. Come on, what do you I'll give you? I give you a metro. Just a now agreement. Oh, so, right, we have real strict, even with those two words, we have noun agreement. We have, uh, uh, we could talk that strictly. Yeah, yeah. But now let's take it to that general, that cultural level. Modern, the reader, the reader, the reader. Right, absolutely. You, so we talk about how this is different from the car from the 70s, right? The first question I would ask if I were the foreigner, I'd say, here's a metro car. How do we use it? Exactly, right? Terrific grammar there. Any Russian, who are the Russians here? How do you say, how do I use it in Russian? Right? And you get that wonderful form of Koizavatsa with what case? It's, it's reflexive verb with instrumental. Oh my god, we're talking about deep grammar here. And it's a pure cultural object, a single object. Okay, you're getting it now. I'm going to go fast for a couple of these because I want to get to the crux here. So, something again, uh, a, a newspaper, why are Russian newspapers uh, trashier, they're in color, what's going on with them, what you know, can talk about, how, how information is disseminated, you get all that. Let me talk about now, what do you do with this, in, to deal with part three. I want to focus in on getting to one medium, video, whether it's online, or whether it's simple digital video that we use on from a DVD that you, that you use in class. I want to talk about what I said back in the very first, that very first talk on the very first day, when I said trying to turn our languages into active learners. To get them to stop saying, here's the book, learn what's in the book, but instead rather to have their minds go to see things as they are in the environment as active, as interesting. Why is it that way? Why do they call it there? Why does the door work this way? Remember that old video of the, the last president, Norshkov? trying to figure out how to get through the door in Japan. It's kind of on the wrong side, right? The whole, it's something that simple, right? What door works? How do you get through it? If you've been in Moscow, you'll know there are these long facades with about 10 little doors, and only two will work. The one to the farthest right here, and the one to the farthest left here, to keep the cold out. But it still will drive you crazy, you're going to try it. I do every single door until you get to the last one, and it will be the one that works. So get them to be active learners, to question things, to look at things. And we do that by giving them interesting bits of culture. We use authentic materials. And again, I don't need to take that. We try to, and I know a lot of you do this already, you know, DLI is really working more and more on developing materials that simulate a real life environment, trying to put them in country without being, put your students in country without being in country, to simulate a linguistic and non linguistic environment. Is any, and I, bet I use the word video, but it could be any bit of reality, even a Coke can, is anything we use to teach. Language, lingual culture, language and culture, good. Well, of course not. Of course not. So how do we how do we do? Here's what we want. If it's useful, it should have these real simple elements. One, it should have good linguistic material. There should be something to say about it. It has current material, accurate but not prescriptive, right? The classic thing of uh, in, in the US, you're sitting in your room and you hear and you say, who is it? It's me, right? No one that I know in way. <laughs> really, really, it is I, Thomas, <laughs> waiting to enter the building. And then they'll be back and say, that's right. But what is said, it's me. So we want it to be correct. Current, accurate, but not prescriptive, right? right. And useful stuff that they're going to use. We want it to have a high audio visual correlation. Again, not just the video. That Coke can, you want what you see on the can to be worthy of being talked about. So you want the object to be worth its while, basically. Um, multiple layers. This is actually, in my view, the most important thing. You want to be able to go back to that simple Coke can, uh, a cell phone, an iPad, whatever you're going to use as your cultural object to talk about, and be able to go back to it, to return to it the next day or later that day, and peel apart bits of it like an onion. First, we're going to talk about the language body. Now we're going to talk about when you use it. Now how you use it. Why you use it. How you use it in, in different contexts. So, right? Tear it apart. And ultimately, it needs to be high.
high production values. That's kind of cool, right? It has to have that look that you, you know, the student is like, what is that? I want, I want to talk about that. I want to, can, you, can, I, can I hold it? Can I see it? Right? You want it to, to look good. How do we exploit these materials? I'm going to go fairly quickly just because I want to do a quick preview, right? Set your students up, your learners up, to be working with it. I'm about to show you this, or you're about to hold that, or we're going to talk about this, and here's why. Because I need you to be able to understand the ABC. Get them ready to look at it. Make them active. Again, active in it. And then the important one, task it. Say why it is I've got you looking at the metro. Okay? How do you get from the mixed language audience here, the common language we've got here is English, a couple of English language tag important things. And that's all I would do. That's enough. Okay, so they know this is from 1999, it's a film American Beauty. Let's see what that is. Let's see if this is going to work for us. That's how that looks good. What's that? From the other side? Cool. Let it sound. Come on. It's like. Hang on, hang on. Are we still? Are we sound working or not working? No. Oh, the speakers are on really loud, so be careful when it comes on. Oh, oh, that worked. Wait, that worked. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. So it's cool stuff that we can do very simply. As we get further along, the relationships. 
So what do you think the relationship is between the husband and wife there? Is it a happy marriage? Uncontrolled. How do we know it's not? Yeah, and what, what does that kiss get into this really clearly unhappy, unhealthy relationship? So you can see we're going to go, please. Are you talking about awkwardness? Oh, gosh, yes. <clears throat> and, and awkward, by the way. To me, awkward, confusion, embarrassment, all those things really are those wonderful cultural, culturally embedded emotions that you can't teach in a simple textbook, right? What is it that makes people uncomfortable, right? I've shown this to different, it's funny, again, to different audiences, and they react completely different based on their cultural background, right? Russian audience that I showed this to, by the way, this is so normative. They would say, what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with them. The husband and wife seem perfectly fine. I'm sure he's got two or three mistresses, too. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, let me move on. So I've got just a few minutes here. I want at least to, in fact, I may, let me skip. I'm going to skip Mr. Ripley just because. But I promise I'll put these on the PowerPoint that I'll set up. But let me do one quick short one from Russian that you don't need to know in Russian for. To show you, in fact, one of the joys in my view, the cultural element in teaching short visual text is that they can be almost wordless and convey volumes of meaning, linguistic, even though there's no language, and paralinguistic, right? How many people said, how they behave, what they look like, and what the environment is like. This is from a terrific little film from 2006 called Peter FM about a Russian radio station and this, this relationship. I'm not going to give you this about up. It's a short little clip, almost no language, tiny little bits of pieces you don't need to know. Watch it. And you'll see right away, your brain is going to be saying, I know what I would do with this. And in fact, it could be in almost, almost any European country. Oh, no, 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 I know I'm late and I'm swamped. It's one o'clock. I just woke up. I'm sorry. 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 I'm
So our student has learned sure means yes. So why do we think why you native speakers who watch this know he can't make a martini? Intonation. His face and? Intonation. Intonation and? The hesitation. Those three, I'd say all three. And if you read that for the culture and say, sure, I can do that. Right? Do you know the answer? Sure, I do. Sure, sure. Right? We know, we know. It's, is it true for all languages? No. It's marked differently, right? Culture to culture, language to language. So this is the stuff. So that's what I'm getting at here. We can get to the point where we take the syllabus we've got. I'm not asking us all that we are busy enough to reinvent the wheel, but rather re-examine the wheel you're using. Look at the wheel you're using. What text do you use? What materials do you bring in? And how can something as simple as literally coming into class with you know, a bookmark that you got from country, from in country, a ticket, a ticket stub, a, a, a program from a play, anything, can suddenly become a text for you to use to teach the same content. Don't change the content of what you're teaching, but to enhance that content with this kind of cultural material. The end result, I guarantee you, I'm hoping after those come through with these incredible materials for cultural literacy, that is cultural proficiency guidelines, but that we're going to get to the point where we've got students who are not only linguistically proficient, but culturally proficient. Thanks very much. Guys. Thank you.